Hello, and welcome to IRI Growth Insights, featuring IRI thought leaders, industry partners, and guests. For more than 40 years, IRI has been known for its invaluable data, but these podcasts delve into the insights the data reveal to fuel market disruption and market growth for those in the CPG, retail, healthcare, and media markets. I'm your host, Joan Driggs, coming to you from IRI's corporate headquarters in Chicago. Hello, and welcome to a very special episode of IRI Growth Insights, focusing on dairy. I'm joined by John Crawford, the leader of the Dairy Vertical for IRI, as VP of Client Insights. Um, John's industry expertise is vital as he leads relationships for a number of IRI's top clients and dairy industry association relationships. John and his team create invaluable, forward-looking dairy thought leadership that many, including me, rely on for the most up-to-date dairy insights. Today, we're talking about the dairy category as we're emerging from the pandemic and how innovation in dairy is meeting our changing needs. Um, to get us started, John, can you give us an overview of the dairy category, like how it's doing, our volume sales still up versus 2019, um, any other industry challenges like supply chain and inflation that are really impacting dairy? Yeah, absolutely. So um, let's start by, I always like to start by defining what, what how we define dairy here at IRI. And, and we, we coined a phrase called the dairy 15, and it's essentially 15 dairy categories where we look at the traditional dairy space. We do exclude eggs. Um, they tend to skew the data um, based on um, commodity cost there. We add in refrigerated dips, refrigerated desserts, and frozen novelties and ice cream. So now we're taking part of the frozen uh, case over in addition to all the traditional dairy items that you would think natural cheese, processed cheese, butter, milk, all that kind of good stuff. Um, but across the dairy 15, um, it is it, the dairy 15 is actually down in dollars versus 2020. So uh, down 1.3%, which is, you know, soft for where it normally is. Normally dairy is growing at about 1%, 2%, something around there. But when you look at it versus 2019, um, dairy is up 8%. So we saw a huge resurgence in dairy. Obviously, we saw a huge resurgence across the whole store in 2020 when the pandemic hit um, as folks were you know, sequestered at home. Uh, kids were not going to school. People were not going to work. And, and there was a lot more consumption happening, obviously, at home. Um, and so we saw some big increases in 20, um, 2020. But we gave some of that back in dairy in 20 in 2021, but still up 8% versus 2019. When we look at volume, volume is down versus 2020. It is still up versus 2019, but it's not up as much as dollars are. Um, we obviously see the impact of inflation that has happened in 2021, particularly in the tail end of 2021, leading into 2022 and continuing in 2022. Um, and certainly that is, is impacting dollars being up more than volume. And then within the categories, um, all dairy 15 categories, all 15 of them are up versus 2019, um, except cottage cheese. Cottage cheese is actually the one category that is down um, in 20, uh, it was down in 2020 and it's down in 2021. So cottage cheese, we always thought cottage cheese was gonna was gonna be a resurgence. Um, it just hasn't happened. Um, it's still just a, so I know. Convenient. Why? Why wouldn't? <laughs> what? What's wrong with cottage cheese? I know. I remember you like cottage cheese. Um, <laughs> and and it's and it's a very it's a good food, but it just has this older connotation to it. It has this diet food connotation to it. And I still think that the texture is still an issue with, with cottage cheese for some consumers. Um, so, but there are a couple categories um, that grew in 2020, and I'll walk through those just real quickly. So, yogurt um, was up 3.7. Uh, frozen novelties up five five point eight. Cream, creams and creamers, uh, coffee creamers up two point six. Whipped toppings, refriger refrigerated dips, and refrigerated desserts were all up versus twenty twenty. So in twenty twenty one versus twenty twenty, and they're all up obviously in, in, uh, in increased numbers versus twenty nineteen. Um, okay, and, and so um, it's interesting. I'll jump. I'm going to jump ahead here just a bit, but. Um, when we talk about yogurt in particular and, and, and um, some of the on-the-go uh, categories that we had um, that, that did not see the real increase and in the real boom that we had um, with cooking at home, with eating at home, 
um, uh, a lot of categories that uh, that had a high percent of their volume sold for single serve or on the go did not see that huge boom in 2020. Um, they are seeing a resurgence in 2021. Yogurt being one of those categories with the high um, with a high a single serve component to it. As folks are going back to work, as kids are going back to school, now you're putting that back in the lunch boxes um, and sending on the go. Same thing with snack cheese, where snack cheese has also seen a, a resurgence here in 2021. Um, where it, it saw an increase in 2020, but just not as big as you would have seen with some of the other categories. So, but with yogurt and cheese, so, you know, the snacking sizes were down, but were the larger sizes up over that period? Yeah, absolutely. So we saw, um, we saw a, a shift in a lot of the categories, uh, single serve categories. We saw either a shift to a multi-serve component. So think yogurt, think about the single serve cups of yogurt. We saw a shift and in in an increase in the, the, the bigger pint sizes, right? The ones where you would spoon out yogurt and put it in and have it in multiple uh, serving occasions. In other categories, we saw an increase in multi-packs. So think about soft drinks, right? So you saw, you know, um, cases of soft drinks, uh, uh, 12 packs of soft drinks really saw a resurgence in 2020, um, whereas single serve did not. And obviously convenience saw some decrease, convenience stores saw, saw some decreases and in, in, in some softening as folks were not out and about, right? There's nobody was on the roads. People were not going to get in, get in gas and people were not going to convenience stores. So that's kind of an interesting barometer, you know, using dairy as a barometer for our increasing mobility and seeing some of those, you know, snacking or single serve coming back. That's, that's pretty interesting. So who knew that the dairy case was such a, a barometer of the way we live our lives? And it's interesting. There was there was another component of a barometer. I think this was very fascinating. In 2020, we saw um, margarine and processed cheese grow for the first time in probably five years, six years that I've been looking at it. It had, that those two categories have been down consistently year over year over year. As consumers were moving away from processed foods, we all knew that consumers were moving away from processed foods. But when folks were were um, sequestered at home. Um, we know that processed foods are resurgence. I think I said this on my last podcast, so I'm repeating myself a little bit, but you know, I, I even bought SpaghettiOs for the first time in many, many years. It's still sitting out in the garage. I haven't eaten it yet, but, but folks were, but folks were buying processed foods. They were buying processed cheese to make grilled cheeses for their, for their kids when they were home. And so we saw processed cheese and we saw margarine increase. Those have both come right back down to earth in 2021, right? So those are down, both back down. Um, and then the other thing that we saw was um, a shift a little bit away from plant-based foods. Um, folks started to have a little bit of a different diet um, during the pandemic. Um, that has come back in 2021. Plant-based foods has certainly rebounded. Plant-based um, dairy has certainly rebounded in 2021 as consumers have re, you know, kind of gone back to their, their normal eating patterns. And I know we're going to get into some of that in a little bit as, you know, talking about some growth of pockets or some opportunities, but I wanted to um, kind of talk a little bit, you know, speaking of this whole barometer, we would have thought that um, private brands across, you know, across all these different retailers would have done so much better. We, we published a report at the end of 2021 that's available at our website, iriworldwide.com, um, that really said that, hey, private brands didn't perform as well as we would have expected throughout the pandemic, and especially as inflation started to rise at the end of 2021. But dairy is a very, or traditionally a very private, a heavy private label category. So what is happening in private brands in dairy right now? Yeah, it's it's really interesting. Um, dairy, uh, private label have been outpacing branded in dairy um, for, for a, a number of years. Same thing that we saw with, with um, processed foods being down, we saw private label outpacing branded and dairy for, for a number of years. There are some exceptions to those categories, but but some of the big categories where private label is a huge um, percent, um, when you think about um, overall in the dairy 15, private label makes up about 32, 32% of it. Uh, but within milk, it's 50-50. Natural cheese private label makes up 47%, butter 43%. And actually, actually um, refrigerated whipped toppings which private label has really had a had an had impact on recently. Um, they saw the growth of that category and they really dove into it. Now they represent 53% of whipped toppings. But when you look at growth, 
looking at branded growth versus, versus private label growth, brands really outpaced private label in 2020. When the pandemic hit, brands saw a very big resurgence. Um, you saw Land O'Lakes butter. You saw um, some of the, the staples of you know, Fairlife milk, some of the other um, kind of traditional brands showing up and, and seeing some, some significant growth. In 2021, it's gone back just a little bit. So private labels had a little bit of, a, of an uptick here, but nowhere near where it was before, um, before the pandemic hit. So we, we're starting to see private label uptick a little bit and outpacing branded in, in, a, in a handful of categories, but not near as many. They used to outpace branded in like 13 to 15 categories. And now it's, you know, six categories. And, and that during the pandemic, it was like three categories. Um, and so, but we are starting to see towards the tail end of 2021 going into 2022 here that with, with inflation, um, with the tightening of the pocketbooks, certainly um, consumer behavior is going to start to shift towards a little bit more um, economy products and, and, and private labels should see resurgence. I think there's another component to it in, in that when the pandemic hit and shortages really hit based on uh, not being able to keep uh, food on shelves because of the, because of the big increase in, in demand, um, manufacturers really started to focus in on their biggest items, right? They, they, they shifted their production to their biggest items of which, you know, that probably put um, private label at a little bit of a disadvantage as, as a lot of the brand manufacturers are making the private label. Um, and so there was a focus on kind of the bigger brands um, and the bigger items. Uh, and that I think certainly had a, had an impact on private label as well. And folks were looking for kind of tried and true and, and they were looking for brands that they trusted um, as you know, we were, well, I don't know, I don't know about, we, we weren't all, but I was certainly, you know, in a, in a pretty, uh, heightened state of, of concern over what was happening then. Um, and so certainly turning to tried and true and trusted brands was certainly, um, a trend that we saw again with inflation really, you know, kicking up in the end of 2021 and, and continuing here in 2022, um, with the instability of the markets with, um, war happening. I mean, it, 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 you know, whatever, everybody asks me, what's the new normal and our folks are really looking forward to get back into normal. Well, I don't know. It depends on what the next 15 minutes hold, whether or not we're going to have normal, you know, in the, in the next you know hour. Right. Um, so I think it's very interesting. I think that there's still a lot of a concern out there. Um, certainly with inflation, I think you're going to see private label see research in 2022. So one of the things we talk about with private label is, you know, creating a point of differentiation. And, you know, aside from the value that you might get from private brands or the trust that people might have in national brands, are there some things that you would look at maybe in terms of attributes or a different value proposition that maybe um, private brands could tap into? Yeah, certainly. Um, you know, there are some folks that that do private label extreme, extremely well. Um, you know, Target with their Good to Gather um, brand has, has had a lot of success. You know, I think that that when we talk about private label, it's not so much, you know, the old school private label. I don't know. I, I'm, I'm going to you know show my age here. I remember the black and white generic labels that you used to have, but that was private label, right? It was just like it would say corn on it and that would be it. It'd be, be, black, be a black corn on, on, on a white label. Um, that's no longer the case, right? These are now brands. These are now brands that are that are differentiated. Um, you think about a company like Trader Joe's, right? Trader Joe's has always had Trader Joe's brand. Um, that is a differentiation for them. That that gets people to come to that store. That's what that's what retailers are trying to do with their private label is get folks to come to their store for their particular brand. So they're building their they're building brands and they're doing a nice job of it. I think that the the resurgence with branded products, national or national branded products, um, stemmed from that that shortage. Um, uh, much more so than necessarily private label brands not resonating with consumers. I think it was just um, it was just more of the tried and true and more of what was being on shelf. But private labels done a really nice job of positioning themselves not just as a value product, but they have tiers of you know different tiers of private label. Um, they have premium private label. They have value private label. Um, and so there, the branding is there. Um, it's it's. And consumers will start to look for that lower price point, and whether they're trading down 
um, whether they're looking for more deals or whether they're looking for, you know, the private label products that are just a little bit less expensive, certainly than, to get that value. Yeah, no, I know. Um, we talked about this last time too. Um, some of like the premium butters and stuff, you know, like I, I will be, I will tell you, we went for a lot of the premium butters, like the special companies come in butters. We were eating all the time. And, and now I'm wondering, you know, what are we going to do with all the prices going up? Is that going to be one of my sacrifices or has it become a go-to for my small household? I don't know. Um, so let's talk a little bit about some of these growth pockets. Um, particularly, there's a couple of things like you've already mentioned, you know, the mobility that we have and how more snackable on the go products are coming back. But can you talk a little bit more about maybe some opportunities across channels um, and how dairy is playing out in different types of retail stores? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we talked um, <clears throat> about C store seeing, you know, a softening in 2020 um, when the pandemic hit. Everybody understands why that happened. But but grocery stores um, saw a real resurgence in 2020 as consumers were looking for, um, you know, obviously food staples, um, they weren't going to the the, um, the the mass merchandise, just the Walmarts and the Targets of the world as much, right? Those are a little bit further out. Um, those are more of a stock up trip. So folks were really, you know, grocery stores had a real resurgence in 2020. Um, mass, which we talked about with Target and, and Walmart and Kmart and those kind of things, they did soften a little bit in 2020 and convenience softened quite a bit in 2020. In 2021, that flipped. So grocery saw some declines and gave back quite a bit of the growth that they that they saw in 2020. Not all of it, but but quite a bit of it. Um, and uh, mass rebounded. So folks started to you know started to go back to Walmart, started to go back to Target, um, and convenience really resurged. So those those make a lot of sense. It is interesting that Club had success in 2020. Pandemic hit. Club was you know really had a lot of success, which makes sense. Folks were stocking up on meats. Folks were stuck trying, to, trying to stock up on toilet paper and paper products, you know, when, when they could find them um, at, a, at a Costco or, or, or a Sam's Club. Um, and, and Club won in 2020, but it also keeps winning in 2021. So as consumers are still getting out, Club is still doing really, really well. So I would say that, you know, if you are a dairy company, um, you need to make sure that you have a channel strategy. Um, you need to make sure you're 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 being relevant to consumers in grocery, but you also need to make sure you're being relevant as consumers are on the go, being being in convenience stores um, and being in mass, and then also being in club. You have to have a club strategy. It is interesting when you look at generations and how they they um, they shop um, channels. Um, you think about the coveted generations of millennials and now Gen Gen Z. Um, millennials over index to mass and super centers, right? So the Walmarts and, and the um, and the targets of the world. Um, Gen Z over indexes to convenience. So if you want to find those consumers, you really need to be relevant in, in mass and in convenience. And it's interesting that Club um, actually has this higher index with Gen X. So that that finally my generation has something to cheer about. That I I have something that they're talking about us. Um, that we are club shoppers, um, true and true. If you look at grocery, that tends to be a little bit older still. Um, and, and certainly drug tends to be older as well. You know, it's interesting. There's such a great story around club because so many households took a lot of the stimulus and invested in club memberships. And it's kind of like once that was in, it stuck. And the older, smaller households like me, we kept our memberships because I love that someone is doing all the curation for me. And if it's something that I like, going back to those fancy butters, you know, of course I'll keep it in my home because it moves fast enough. So you're right. I think that club is going to be with us. It's got a, a whole new generation of shoppers. So th that's great. So we talked a little bit about um, some of those, those opportunities in channels. And I now I want to go back to a little bit of... Um, some of the product opportunities where some of the growth is. And I always love hearing from you because you see products that I don't see. And I would love to kind of dig in and see, like have you share up or scoop up some of those things that you're finding that are really interesting to watch. Yeah. Let me, before I jump into that, I just want to, there's one other um, trend that happened um, and a growth pocket that happened that is interesting to me. 
And when we talk about, uh, we haven't talked about deli cheese really, right? So when we're talking about cheese, we're talking more about the dairy case cheese. Um, when you think about what's going on in the deli, um, there, there, there has been a shift during the pandemic and into 2021 of this shift from the service deli where you're going and you're asking them to, to slice your meats and slice your cheese to this grab and go section. And, and we know during the pandemic that, that some of the service delis got shut down and some manufacturers were really agile and actually started to slice their big blocks of cheese and, and ship those to the stores already pre-packed for this, for this grab and go section. But you have seen that now grab and go is, has grown when you think about service deli and grab and go and you combine those two together. In 2019, grab and go was 41% of the total. Um, now it's 50% of the total. So it is now as big, the grab and go section is as big as the service deli. That's just something that I wanted to also kind of talk about that when you start to think about consumers want to spend a little less time in the stores, they don't really want to wait in line at the, at the service deli as much. And so the, the retailers and the manufacturers have really kind of have, have uh, um, leaned into that. I've definitely, definitely seen those grab and go coffins of, you know, lunch meat and deli cheese. But that brings up another point, And that is almost like the rise of charcuterie. And I would imagine that cheeses just really, you know, they're the showcase there. Um, so what have you noticed there? I mean, is that part of um, the specialty cheese or tell me where, what, how that's doing? Yeah, I think it's it's really interesting um, that when you know we saw a resurgence in in some interesting areas. Liquor saw a big resurgence during the pandemic. Not necessarily surprising, um, but as folks were entertaining at home, that's where charcuterie really came into play, right? Charcuterie and um, and and wine and, and pairings and those kind of things, right? Um, as as people were entertaining at home, and so folks. And, and also with some of the shortages, folks were looking to different areas to store to find, find products. And so I think what you saw was consumers trying new, new cheeses that were in the deli, um, and, they, and they've started to stick. There are some, um, there are some products within the deli that really um, saw some increases that have, have kind of stuck, like Gruyere cheese. Um, that grew um, uh, this past year, in, in addition to growing you know, the year before. Um, you know, mozzarella, fresh mozzarella, especially feta, feta, some of those cheeses are seeing some, some growth, which I think is pretty interesting. Um, you know, Havarti was already kind of there, but you've got, you know, Asiago and Gorgonzola and some other, you know, fancier cheeses that, that folks, I think, tried and have kind of stuck with that. So I think it's pretty interesting that as, you know, the pandemic did change some behaviors that have certainly stuck. They've given back a, quite, a little bit of it, but, but certainly they have stuck. That's great. No, I love that. And and even some of those types of cheese that you mentioned, that speaks to me of more of the home cooks too. You know, things like the mozzarella, the feta, the asiago, those are definitely um, some more interesting meal ingredients or recipe ingredients too. Um, okay, so let's let's All right. into some of my yeah the fun stuff. Uh, tell me what you're seeing out there. Yeah, there's some interesting. Um, Interesting dynamics that are going on within dairy. Um, certainly, you're seeing. I mean, we talked about plant based quite a bit, and and talk a little bit about um, uh, Chibani. I think Chibani is an interesting company. Um, you know, Chibani, a, a strong strong dairy company, um, but they they launched into plant based uh, non dairy yogurt um, a, a few years back, and then they shifted that to oat. And oat is the is the new shining star of plant-based right in dairy. So oat milk passed soy milk as being the second largest um, type of, of plant-based milk behind almond. It's still a ways behind almond, but it has surpassed um, soy. And there's been a lot of plant-based that have come and come and gone, right? You've seen pea milk, you've seen macadamia milk, you've seen flax milk, you've seen cashew and coconut. I mean, there's a lot, been a lot of ones, but oat was the one that stuck. So so um, Chobani got into, you know, plant-based yogurt and then oat yogurt, and then they launched oat milk. And that was their first launch kind of outside of yogurt, which I think was really, really interesting that they launched within plant-based. Then they launched into dairy and into oat-based creamers. So plant-based creamers and dairy coffee creamers. And most recently, which is very, very, I think, exciting, they've launched into this ultra-filtered dairy milk. So 
um, Fairlife a number of years ago um, founded this kind of invented this category of ultra filtered milk. Um, it has less sugar, it has higher protein, it's extended shelf life, um, and it, it just has, and it's also lactose free. So it has a lot of benefits for consumers, but it's, but it is dairy milk. So Chobani has launched into this ultra filtered space. They're the first, not, not the first to kind of follow um, Fairlife, but I think the first real national company that I think can really make a go of this. Um, you've seen, you've seen, you've, you've seen um, some other companies like, uh, like Dairy Gold launch their fit product um, and, and um, uh, uh, Organic Valley launched Organic Valley Ultra. And so their, their folks have been dabbling in this, in this uh, ultra filtered space, but Chobani getting to it, I think is pretty exciting. And then just sticking on milk, I'll, I'll jump over. It is interesting that, that both Silk and So Delicious, um, two companies um, that are plant-based companies for sure, um, and plant-based brands, um, they've both launched these new gener next generation milks. So Silk launched Next Milk, which is a plant-based milk. It is a um, oat and other plant-based almond and soy kind of blends of, of, of plant-based milk. But it is marketed, if you look at it, it is marketed as, as Silk Next Milk. It is marketed as a milk and it looks like a dairy milk. And that'll be very interesting to see how that plays out um, in the marketplace. Um, certainly, uh, you know, almond milk, oat milk, those kind of things have taken the, the milk name and, and milk has a standard of identity with the USDA. And it'll be interesting to see how these play out um, with Silk Next Milk really being called milk and looking like dairy milk whether or not that will have some impact with, with how USDA kind of use these products. Um, so Delicious has the same, same type of a product. It's called Wonder Milk. It is a little bit, it's, it's, it's positioned a little bit differently. It's positioned as more of a, as a dairy free um, and a milk alternative. And so it has a little bit more of that plant-based component to it um, than, than I think that the, the, the Silk um, Next Milk has. And then I'll keep, I'll keep going. So Doug, D-U-G. Fascinating to me. I, I don't know if this is going to stick or not, but it is potato milk. Um, and as I talk through, I know, I know, as I, I know, as I talk through, you know, a number of these different types of, of um, nuts and, and plant-based um, milks that have come out or, or dairy that has come out, um, you think about there's, there's, the, uh, there's a company called Lava that has a, a peely nut um, yogurt. Um, but Doug potato milk is really interesting. And they're, they are really touting the fact that it performs like milk, particularly in, in coffee and creamers. And that's how oat milk really did succeed was that it kind of performed a little bit more like, like dairy milk, um, almond milk and soy milk didn't quite perform that same way. Um, and so they have a bar barista blend of this and, and it'll be interesting. I, I'm not expecting potato milk to be the next big milk. Um, it just as pea milk, you know, we thought might've been a big, big one coming in. Um, I've not tried it yet. I'd be interested to see how it tastes. Um, but it is an interesting, an interesting brand that's out there. And then you've got, um, a company like Lifeway, um, which is really fascinating. Um, Lifeway is a kefir company. Um, so think, um, think fermented milk basically. Right. Um, and they've come out with an oat based product that has functional mushrooms in it. Um, and it's called MSRUM. I don't even know M M S R M S H R M um, oat, oat, oat. And it's really interesting. Um, it'll be interesting to see how that plays out. Um, you know, it's got a lot of uh, probiotic benefits and um, adaptogens, which I don't even know what those are. I think you do, Joan. Yeah, adaptogens. And you know what? I wish the industry wouldn't use that, but it's essentially like a calming or a de stressing, um, you know, take the edge off type of claim. And I think they're doing a good, they're doing a good job, right? They call it like, so one is called support, right? And they've got, they've got these products that are, I think, pretty interesting. Um, but I, you know, who knows whether those will play out. I know that they've done a good job. Um, they've got one called focus and one called calm, just as, just as you were talking about. Um, it'll be interesting, uh, to see if Lifeway can, uh, you know, they've, they've done a good job in that kefir space. It'll be interesting to see how this plays out in the plant-based space. Well, to me, when I think of mushroom too, I think of like umami. So I'm wondering if that has like more of a, a thicker, more dairy-like mouthfeel. I don't know. I'll, I'm going to have to look for that. It's, it sounds interesting. Um, you're right. It's a weird, I don't know. 
I'm kind of with you. It's it's interesting. It is very yeah. interesting. <laughs> it is very interesting. Who knows how it'll play out? But Kiefer has a very like um, thicker texture to it too, and and a, and a kind of a, a tangier texture to it. I don't know how this is going to play out because this is a an oat based product and not not a dairy based product. Interesting. So anything maybe outside of um, some of these. Um, milk alternatives, anything in some of the other categories, some of your other 14 categories? Yeah. So uh, we see a lot of the innovation happening starting in milk or in yogurt. Um, but certainly cheese is an area um, where we're seeing a, a lot of innovation happening. Um, you saw a company like Sargento come out with their Balance Breaks product um, a number of years ago and continuing to evolve that 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 product. Um, you're seeing a, a company like Baby Bell jump into the plant-based space, um, or excuse me, Bell brand jump into that plant-based space. They have a, a, a brand called uh, Nourish um, that is a, blend, a brand, a, a sub-brand of plant-based cheese, but they have also launched a Baby Bell. So think about the, the small little wedges, the, the red wax wedges, or excuse me, the red, red wax um, snack cheese that you peel that wax back, right? The Baby Bells. They have launched a plant-based version of that in green wax. Um, so it will be very interesting to see how that plays out. Um, it is certified plant-based and certified vegan. Um, so I think that, that that should do really, really well, assuming that it performs similarly to how their their you know their red baby bell performs. Um, and so there's you know, there's some of those kind of items um, that are out there. Um, I think cheese, for me, cheese should be the next kind of big growth area for plant-based. Um, if you think about uh, plant-based milk represents about 13%, 14% of total milk. Um, whereas for cheese, plant-based represents about uh, 1%. Um, and so if you think about those categories are about the same size, think about the upside potential for plant-based within cheese. And, and certainly there's been some advances in how those products are performing. Um, you think about a company like Miyoko's that has their, their mozzarella tech product that can be put onto, um, you know, put onto uh, um, pizzas and, and whatnot. And I think that there, there's some opportunity there within plant-based cheese for sure. So interesting. I love, I love, I'm always been a fan of new products. So thanks for, thanks for opening my eyes a little bit. Um, so John, as we wrap up, I really just love to get your outlook for 2022. You know, we're, we're in a really challenging time, as you mentioned, I know you said, Hey, it can, it can change every 15 minutes, but what are you seeing for the category? What opportunities do you see to attract new buyers to further get them involved and engaged in the category? Yeah, I think that the the 2022 there's there's a lot of um, you know factors at play. Um, certainly, the impact of reopening. Um, you know, I know um, folks have you know mass mandates are are are, are gone. Um, folks are getting back out into the world. Um, and, uh, I, I think that, you know, folks really want to have, you know, be, be back to normal, be right back to where we were in 2019. I know I do. Um, and, and, but now you've got, you know, really high inflation. Um, you've got whatever the next variant is going to be, right. We all kind of made it through Omicron. Um, but what's the next variant that's coming, you know, whatever the B, whatever the next variant of Omicron that's supposedly hitting, hitting in Europe right now, you know, who knows what that but that does when it when it gets here or if it gets here, um, and then you start to think about um, the the impact of supply chain and the um, the lack of the workforce out there, right? The 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 workforce shortage that's out there and how that might impact um, restaurants more so than than um, at home food. And so when you when you kind of factor into inflation and some of the workforce um, shortages. You know, will that continue to shift dollars back to food at home versus food away from home? That will be an interesting dynamic in, in 2022 um, for sure. Um, and then out of stocks, you know, I think out of stocks on shelf will certainly benefit um, brands that can provide reliable supply. And if I am a brand, I am touting to my retailer that you know I am a real, I'm a reliable source of supply for you, and I will make sure that your shelves are stocked. I know I I shop um, I shop Instacart. And I was trying to buy raspberries and uh, the entire store, I live in California and the entire store was out of raspberries. The entire store was out of raspberries, which I thought was just amazing to me that that could possibly even happen. But you think about um, the shortage of supply is, is evolved, but it's still here. 
Um, and so it'll be interesting to see how, how it all plays out. Um, I think that value, I think you're going to start to see folks um, be a little bit more price sensitive in 2022, and that will lead to folks looking for more deals. So, so certainly in order to be relevant with consumers, you need to be you know, uh, relevant from a price standpoint. Um, we know a lot of manufacturers and retailers are taking price increases um, to keep up with, with some of the inflation pressures that they have. Um, but it'll be interesting to see how that all plays out. Um, I do think that um, that you can win um, in addition if you have that channel strategy. I think that that was something that we talked about before. Um, you want to make sure you're relevant in club and in C store um, and in mass and in, and in grocery for sure. Yeah, that's I couldn't agree more. And I think across the, the store, wherever you are, you really need to communicate the value of whatever it is to shoppers right now, especially because we don't know how long inflation is going to be with us. So that's excellent. I just want to recap a couple other things that you said along the way. And that is that, you know, overall dairy might be softening a little bit in dollars or volume, but compared to 2019, we're still seeing much higher numbers, which is pretty interesting. Um, some of the categories that are really growing right now, things like yogurt and frozen novelties, coffee creamers. Hey, we're still making coffee at home, which is pretty interesting. Top whipped toppings and refrigerated dips. Um, even some of the things that were down below or down in 2020, you know, or um, in early 2021, some of the snackable items, some of the more on the go or single serve items, those are all coming back. Um, even the shift away from plant-based is starting to return. And I think it might be because of some of those exciting products that you told you talked about. For sure, we're going to be keeping our eyes on some of the new emerging, I don't know, is mushroom even a plant? Some of the fungal <laughs> fungal products um, that are coming our way. And I'm really intrigued by some of those blends. Um, and I wonder where that's going to go. So I think that that's pretty interesting. And the new categories, like with cheese being really ripe for some um, plant-based innovation. So with that, John, I want to thank you so much for your time and your invaluable insight. And um, I'll see you next time in the dairy case. Thanks so much, Joan. Appreciate it. Thank you for listening. Please become a subscriber and let us know what you want to learn more about. We'll serve it up in a future IRI Growth Insights episode. Look for us wherever you get your podcasts and be sure to review IRI Growth Insights. Also, visit us on the web at iriworldwide.com and connect with us on Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn.